Rear Admiral Thomas M. Dyke is retired. Welcome aboard for another of the true stories of the silent service. This is the story of a man's faith, both in himself and in the courage, daring, and effectiveness of the silent service and those who serve in it, and how that faith enabled him to make the decision upon which depended the lives of thousands of our fighting men. The Sea of Japan, October 1943. So strongly protected, so well guarded by the narrow straits affording the only approaches to it, that an unending stream of strategic war materials moved constantly and unescorted across the inviolate, placid waters. Inviolate, did we say? Placid, did we say? Not to the USS Wahoo. But then after she left her mark and started back home, the door to the Sea of Japan slammed shut on the USS Wahoo forever. October 1943, the Pearl Harbor Operations Office of Rear Admiral Charles A. Lockwood, Commander Submarine Force Pacific Fleet. I hate to see that, Admiral. Too long overdue. We have to presume she's lost. But she left her calling card. They know she was there. And they'll do something about it right here. The Straits of La Perouse, Tsugaru, Tsushima are only approaches to the Sea of Japan. They'll lay a solid barrier of mines across those waters, and their shipping will be as safe from submarine attack as though it were on the moon. We may be a long way from it right now, Dick, but one of these days we'll be knocking at their home door. That's when we'll have to get in there smash those supply lines, break the back of their resistance. Well, of course, no one's ever found a way for a submarine to penetrate a heavily laid minefield. Then we'll find a way. We'll get our ships through those mines, even if we have to... Break out the last report from San Diego Naval Research. Dick? This is a report from the San Diego Naval Research Laboratory. It covers some of the hush-hush gadgets they're working on. One of them's called the, uh, the FMS, Frequency Modulated Sonar, an attempt at a mine detection apparatus for surface vessels, minesweepers. How far are they going with it? Found it impractical. Effectiveness was nil in disturbed waters. What good is it to us? Maybe it'll work if adapted to a submarine where conditions are different. Maybe work the way we want it to. Those are a lot of maybes, Admiral. Then I'll add one more. Maybe this is the key that'll open the door to the Sea of Japan. Put me through to Admiral Nimitz. days, Admiral Lockwood made a flying trip to the Naval Research Laboratories in San Diego. For test purposes, the FMS had been installed aboard a small motorboat by Dr. George P. Harnwell, civilian head of the laboratories. This is only a handmade test apparatus, Admiral. Purely experimental, but properly developed, it should be accurate enough for all practical purposes. We should be picking up that boat any second. You'll see her first as an irregularly shaped blob on the screen. Yeah, there she is. Note her position. Distance and direction are clearly indicated on the screen. Seems to work well enough on surface ships. Uh, that's what I meant about its being experimental. Still far from effective in disturbed surface water. Would it be more effective underwater for use by a submarine? Yes. Yes, I think perhaps it would. Could you perfect it well enough so that it could pinpoint mines? Point them out so accurately that a submarine could move through a tightly laid minefield in perfect safety? Admiral? I don't know. Doctor, 
I have to know. We'll do our best. June 23rd, 1944. The USS Spadefish, first submarine to be equipped with the FMS, headed for a dummy minefield off Pearl Harbor to undergo the maiden test of the new equipment. The tests were very disappointing. Come in. No luck, sir. The technicians can't find out what went wrong with the FMS this morning. Looks like a pretty temperamental gadget, Admiral. I know. We've seen it work. We've seen it go so haywire that nobody could tell what was up. We've lost nine more submarines so far this year. Unless we can break into the Sea of Japan and destroy her supply lines, the war can drag on for years longer. On each day we risk losing more ships, more American lives. Dick, I'm still convinced the FMS will work, that it's the only answer. But I'm only one man. What if I'm wrong? What if we can't lick the problems? Do I have the right to go ahead, to send even one crew out, depending on this gadget for their lives? There's only one man who can answer that, sir. All right, Dick. I know my answer. I don't have the right. Admiral Nimitz is already on our side. Admiral King's out here for a conference. If he'll give me his blessing, I'm going to push ahead with the FMS until it's perfected. Dick, we're moving west. New headquarters for Com Sub Pack is going to be on Guam. That's good news, sir. Did Admiral King have anything else to say, sir? Well, he was pretty flattering about our contribution to the Marianas invasion, particularly the wiping out of that troop convoy. Well, that was very kind of him. Did the Admiral have anything else to say, sir? No. No, I don't believe that he... Oh, yes. Yes, there was one other thing. He's given us the green light to go ahead on the FMS. They'll be installed in a wolf pack of submarines. As soon as we're satisfied with them, we can tackle the Sea of Japan. Well, that was very nice of him, sir. I'll start preparations for our move to Guam. <laughs> Saipan, March 1945. The USS Tunney, first of the FMS equipped submarines in the wolf pack assigned to enter the Sea of Japan, arrived to undergo final pre-combat tests. In temporary offices aboard a submarine tender, Admiral Lockwood conferred with Dr. Malcolm Henderson from the Naval Research Laboratories and Commander George E. Pierce, skipper of the Tunney. All the bugs ironed out now? If the FMS is ever going to work, it'll work right now. It's as perfect as we can possibly make it. How do you feel about things, George? Well, the Tunney's a sweet ship, sir. And my crew's the best. Go ahead, George. Admiral, my men and I know the Tunney backwards and forwards. We know her strength and her weaknesses. But there's one thing we don't know. The FMS. That's right, sir. Your men concerned about it? <laughs> well, let's put it this way. They wish the Bureau of Ships would stop loading us down with a lot of untried electronic gadgets. They don't like the idea of risking their lives playing Buck Rogers with a lot of lights and buzzers. Feel that strongly about it, do they? Yes, sir. Now, not only the men on my ship, but I've heard the same from others, from the skippers on down. I'm convinced that the FMS can take us into the Sea of Japan without the loss of a single ship or a single man. But nobody under my command is going to receive such orders unless he's as convinced as I am. A dummy minefield's been laid in the submarine sanctuary. We'll run the tunny through it right now. Only, I won't judge the test. We'll let you do that.
Jack. Barry. Can't make it out, sir. Not, not coming in too clear. Can't you bring her in? I'm trying to, sir, but I just don't seem to be able to. Now it's gone all together, sir. Right five degrees, runner. Contact. Barry. Just jumping all over the screen, sir. Just can't seem to bring her in. Now that one's gone too, sir. Keep trying. Left, 10 degrees, runner. Hour after hour passed as the tunny made run after run through the dummy minefields. Time after time, the result was the same. That's the third mine we struck. Might as well return to port. Surface! <laughs> You, Admiral, I didn't see your orderly. Not at all, George. Help yourself. Thank you. Not a very successful day, was it, sir? Not very. You still have faith in the FMS, don't you, Admiral? I do. But I'm afraid that's more than your crew has just about now. Well, it's a funny thing about submariners, sir. Mm, that's good coffee. Yes, it is. As I was saying, it's a funny thing about submariners. You take a man who's got a lot of faith in his skipper, and he'll ride along with them no matter what. Ever hear what the men in the submarine force call you, sir? I can imagine what your crew feels like calling me. <laughs> they call you Uncle Charlie. It seems to be a little saying around the fleet every time one of us makes a kill. That's for Uncle Charlie. That's the way they put it. They have a great deal of respect for you, sir, both as a man and as a friend. You've something on your mind, George. What is it? I wonder if the Admiral would mind doing me a little favor. If I can? You know, I just recently made commander, and I haven't had a chance to get myself a brass hat. I was wondering if you'd mind having the base at Pearl get me a brass hat size 7 and 3 eighths and have it sent out here. You want me to send to Pearl for a friend? If you don't mind, sir. You see, I'd like to have it waiting for me here when we get back from our little patrol in the Sea of Japan. You'll have it. Thank you, sir. Come in. Looks like you found the trouble, Mal. Yes, sir. It wasn't in the set. The FMS was as sound as a dollar. There were a couple of loose connections that were kind of hard to reach. Anytime you want to retest the Tunny, she's ready for you. George, be ready to get underway at dawn. Aye, aye, sir. Contact, bearing 350, sir. Contact. Bearing 355, sir. Right, 15 degrees, rudder. That's number three, sir. Well, looks like we've just found the key to the door leading to Hirohito's bathtub. Contact, 030, sir. Guam, May 23rd, 1945. Nine submarines, wolf pack known as the Hellcats, fully equipped with FMS tuned to perfection, stood ready and waiting. 
The commanders of the Hellcat submarines assembled in the operations office of the submarine tender Holland. Commander Barney Seaglaff, who worked with Admiral Lockwood as planning and training officer for the operation, gave them their final briefing. You'll enter the Sea of Japan through Shishima Straits. Intelligence indicates that there are three, possibly four, strings of mines placed at at least three different levels of depth. Now, you'll run the mine barrier in groups of three. You can reconnoiter your areas, but you'll remain unseen until sunset of June 9th. That's the hour for commence firing. Any questions? How do we get off, Barney? You rendezvous here on June 24th. Make your exit out of La Perouse Strait that night. Any further questions? Gentlemen, I've been working on this project for a long time. Today brings all my hopes, my dreams to a climax. I don't have to tell you that I have faith in you, your crews, your ships to carry out this operation. The fact that you're here states that better than I can. I've just one favor to ask. I've never fired one torpedo during wartime in anger at an enemy. Unfortunately, my request to accompany this mission personally has been denied. All I ask of you now is that you fire plenty of them. Not for me, but for everything we're fighting for. Good hunting. God bless you. June 5th, the Shishima Straits. Quiet, peaceful, placid on the surface. Heavily laden with certain death below. This is the captain. We're ready to make our run through the Straits of Shishima. You all know what to expect. You've been trained and briefed. You know what we can do, and you know what the FMS can do. Admiral Lockwood believes we can penetrate these Straits without losing a ship or a man. I believe it. Good luck. Bearing 350, sir. Two of them, sir. One to port and one to starboard. And real close. Yeah, they're too close to swing around them. Right five degrees rudder. If that FMS is right, and it better be, we've got just about enough room to move between those two mines. scraping the hull. Thank you, baby. Thank you. From June the 4th through June the 8th, the Sea of Japan remained as placid, as calm, as apparently inviolate as it had for almost the past two years. Then just before sunset on the evening of June the 9th, one by one, the periscopes of the United States submarines broke the surface of the waters of the Sea of Japan. Nine had 
entered the Straits of Tsushima. Nine were now ready, waiting, and eager to carry out their orders. June 9th to June 24th, the Hellcats rained concentrated destruction on Japanese shipping. The sea of Japan was no longer the Emperor's peaceful bathtub. Strewn with wreckage, supply lines blasted beyond all future repair. This was indeed an operation that helped to break the back of Japan's resistance forever. Rendezvous point, June 24th, La Perouse Strait and the Hellcats began their exit. Only eight of them now. The bone fish had been left behind somewhere in the Sea of Japan. But Admiral Lockwood had kept his word. The bone fish was sunk by enemy action. Not one ship, not one man was lost to enemy mines. accomplished. in a moment with our special guest. And now I'd like you to meet the officer whose story you have just seen, Vice Admiral Charles A. Lockwood, who was Commander of Submarine Force Pacific Fleet. Thanks for the compliment, Tommy. But it's not my story alone. Much credit belongs to the civilian scientists who brought the FMS into being, the members of my staff who worked so hard and long to affect what many considered my harebrained scheme, and the skippers and crews of the Hellcats who carried out the operation so brilliantly. I know I don't have to remind you how tough and at times heartbreaking those long months must have been while you sweated out your dream about the FMS. They had their low moments, moments when I was just about ready to jump overboard. Can you remember if there was any one single thing that helped you to maintain your faith? That's an easy one, Tommy. It was a broom. A broom that I never saw again. I'm sure you know the one I mean. Every submariner knows it, Admiral. It was always there, lashed to her periscope when she came back from a successful patrol. The broom worn so proudly by the USS Wahoo with Mush Morton at her helm. But then I'm not so sure I didn't see it once more. When was that, Admiral? The night I learned the operation had been a success. I was on the quarterdeck of the Holland, looking out to sea thinking about the gallant ships and men who had given their lives to make possible this crowning success. And somewhere out there in the darkness, I seemed to see the barnacle-encrusted hull of the Wahoo, and the broom was lashed proudly to her periscope above the shattered bridge, signaling, well done, to the Hellcats. It is not normal for a junior to say well done to a senior, but I know I speak for our audience, and all of us who are so fortunate as to serve under you, when I say this was a magnificent accomplishment. Thank you, Tommy. Thank you for being with us, Admiral. I hope you will join us again for another true and exciting story of the silent service. Take your down and up the line Through the deep blue underneath the ocean We'll control the ocean wide From down, down underneath the sea Underneath the sea